of whether greenhouse gases warm the planet is absolutely unequivocal. CO2 does warm the planet. Uh, we are putting CO2 into the atmosphere, and we know that the CO2 building up in the atmosphere is in fact from our emissions because of isotope ratios. CO2 from other sources has a different isotope ratio to that coming from fossil fuels. So we know that's happening, we know that that's increasing the temperature. The one last thing where there's maybe a little bit of uncertainty, and that's where maybe that 80 to 95% rating comes in, turns out to be in, in the, what we call feedbacks. And the one big feedback in the climate is this thing about clouds. So the problem, and it's just worth very briefly touching on, is simply this. That when CO2 enters the atmosphere, it warms the planet. When the planet's warmer, more water vapour gets into the atmosphere. Now, water vapour can do three different things. Uh, the one is it's a greenhouse gas in its own right, so it could send the planet into much, much more warming. But the second is, water obviously forms clouds. Dark clouds cool the planet, so it could form a negative feedback. It could actually, more water could mean more clouds, uh, more dark clouds and a cooler planet. But then it also forms these white clouds, which actually warm the planet. And at the minute, our parameterization, uh, the way models treat clouds is very poor, especially actually, interestingly for you guys, for the west coast uh, of southern Africa is one area where the, the models fail specifically to generate the clouds and to model the clouds. And so uh, this means that it's very unclear, or at least it is more unclear than the rest, as to what effect water vapour will have in the atmosphere. Will it be one which sends us into extreme more warming, or will it be one that buffers, that actually keeps the planet some kind of homeostasis? The balance of opinion, as you can imagine from these three, is that there's two warming uh, possibilities and one non. So just on the first approximation, you get a feel that the balance of scientific opinion is actually that it will do a lot more warming. I nearly forgot my pencil. Okay, so that's the science aside. The science is unequivocal. The planet is getting warmer. It's most likely our fault. Uh, we can most likely model that into the future and see that very bad things will happen out of it. With more water, with more energy in the environment, we expect the uh, air to be able to hold more water vapour. That means more storms. More storms in some places means that the water doesn't go to others. It means more droughts. So we expect that this to be a serious and uh, difficult and real problem in the future. So why then? I mean, this would seem amazing, having said all of this, but it still seems to generate lots of public debate. Particularly, it has to be said in terms of, then how do we respond to it? But there are still some people who don't want to admit that it's happening. And so, what I want to do is, is take that as an interesting observation. The science is quite clear, but yet there's still this huge debate. So why? I, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of some of uh, the points that are uh, raised in the general, and this is more towards the philosophy of science discourse <coughs> as to why this happens. One of them, the first, is to do with the nature of science itself. Science, by definition, is a practice of what we call organised scepticism, of specifically and deliberately questioning and trying not to believe what other people say. Secondly, as I've said before, we have this interesting space where we combine scientific and political problems, or ethical problems. Next, it requires us to trade off the needs of the present against the needs of the future. And when we do that, we hit into an interesting economics concept called the discount rate, I want to tell you about. And lastly, we have to do all of this under time pressure. Right, the longer we wait to take action, the more serious the problem becomes. So, I'm going to talk just a little about each of those. The first is on the scientific method. At school, we tend to learn science very badly. Uh, matric uh, in this country, and it's not unusual in the world, this is a global problem, is taught that you're good at science if you know how to label diagrams, right? If you can label the bits of the DNA, you get the full marks on the biology paper. It becomes an exercise in learning a list of facts. And most of the public, that's what science is. It's a body of facts that, to be learned. If you learn them, you are therefore a good scientist. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Science, I would argue, is much, more, is much better described as an interplay between observations and theories, and a continual one at that. And interestingly, I'll come now to note that science questions have an underlying knowable answer. Um, for example, uh, how many leaves are on a tree? We can count, and we, there is an underlying knowable answer. If we counted, 
and we all did it, we'd get different answers. And there'd be some uncertainty in that. And I'll come to, to that. But there is a noble answer. But science very rarely gets to that final answer. Most of the time, we're not there, even for things that we think we are. And I'll give you an example uh, which I'd like to work with you, which is the question of why is the climate in summer different from winter? Uh, does anybody know? When are you going to volunteer the answer for me? Why is it different in summer to winter? I, I just commented, Cape Town winter is cold, still cold there. Why might that be? It's grade five. You're all at university. <laughs> Someone be brave. There's food outside. You don't get it to some of the answers. So. Why might summer be different from winter? Go on, grade five. Think back. Come on, someone's going to help me out here. Otherwise, I'm just going to study staring at you guys. That was, I want to take that as a hand. I have forgotten, but it has, it has something to do with the, the health tilting. Perfect, perfect. Okay, that, that is exactly the grade five answer, right? We're, we're taught at grade five that the earth tilts towards so the southern hemisphere is towards the sun in our summer, and the northern hemisphere is towards the sun in our winter, right? What's fascinating about that answer is basically no one can remember it. And lots of people uh, remember a different answer, which is that they remember that the Earth's orbit isn't spherical like this around the sun, but elliptical. It goes further away and closer. And lots of people will give the answer that the Earth is closer to the sun in summer. And in fact, so you got it right, most people get it wrong. And in fact, there's a great video online I can propose you go and watch. It's entitled Harvard, a Private Universe, where we discover they interview Harvard graduates on their graduation day. They have had the most expensive education money can buy in the whole world, and yet they know less about why summer is warmer than winter than this lady. They all give the answer that the Earth is closer to the sun in summer. But what's interesting is this can be used to nicely illustrate the process of science, because that answer that Harvard graduates give isn't entirely wrong, okay? We are actually closer to the sun in summer here, so our summer coincides with the point where the Earth is closest, not furthest away, and that does have an impact on our climate. Our climate is significantly different than it was 10,000 years ago, where the reverse was true. Uh, 10,000 years ago, the Earth was closest in the northern summer, and for our summer, we were furthest away. And the climates were completely different. So one reason why summer is different than winter is that the Earth is closer or further away. But what you can do is that you could, with those Harvard graduates, you could then present them with a new piece of data, right? And you could tell them, okay, I like your hypothesis, but here's a new piece of data. When it's um, summer in, uh, in Joburg here, it's winter in New York. And then they would have to think and come away with a new hypothesis, right? The new one would be, uh, this lady's one, that we have the tilt. But I can then give you another piece that's still, even though it's the grade five textbook answer, that still doesn't really explain it, because I can now give you one more bit of evidence. And I can say, in India in summer, you have a monsoon, but in Africa in exactly the same latitude, so the same tilt towards the sun, no monsoon. So the difference between summer and winter can't merely be the tilt from one to the other. It can't be just the orbit, and it can't be just the tilt. We have to do more. And this is, this is a microcosm of all of science advancement, right? It isn't a list of facts, but a continually interpreting. Here's a theory, here's new data, here's a theory. This is most uncomfortable for politicians, because it means that there's never a final answer, okay? We get closer and closer to a better answer, but there's never a final one. The great example of this is obviously Newton's laws, which we thought would never be overturned. And then Einstein came along and they were rewritten. So this makes people uncomfortable and it makes policy decisions difficult. There's a whole bunch written, and I can invite you to read it, on dealing with uncertainty. In the case of climate change, the uncertainties are small, but politicians still feel nervous dealing with them and dealing with the fact that there's never a final answer. The second one is this point about political, science, uh, ethical versus science questions. Uh, and so to introduce that, I want you guys to think about washing up. 
you all look old enough that you now either do the washing up or avoid it, right? <laughs> um, well, you've got to do one of them, or, or basically nobody in your household washes up. The question, the question is, when you wash up, do you get your dishes clean? Yes, you'd say. So then, I, I would challenge that and say, I had a microscope, could I not maybe find one bit of dirt on your dishes? <laughs> I could, right? You could theoretically, I could give you a chemistry lab and you could have a week to clean that dish and then I couldn't find anything with a microscope. But actually, then I could get an electron microscope but I could find one molecule of dirt. So my point is, you don't actually aim to get your dishes clean. You aim to get them clean enough. And this illustrates the two types of questions. Are the dishes clean, and by what um, uh, measure are they not clean? How many molecules of fat per centimetre squared is a scientific question. It has a knowable answer. If I have the right tools, I can take my electron microscope and I can count the molecules of fat, and I can tell you your dish is not clean because it has X number per square centimetre. Are they clean enough is an example of an ethical question. It has no right answer. And it requires compromise if people disagree. So for example, I might, you might be able to hear I come from England. Where I come from, uh, washing up involves washing the plate and then putting it on the draining rack. Right? Here, it involves washing the plate and then, in a water-scarce country, running it under fresh water to remove the bubbles. <laughs> which, means, which strikes me as madness. I think mean, well, it's a fact and it won't do you any harm, but South Africans need to wash it up. What's clean enough is different. And of course, in my household, that causes a problem, right? Um, because my missus wants us to rinse them, I don't. There's two ways to solve ethical, political questions, and it's very important to just take a moment to think about them. Uh, the one which I would advocate is compromise. Me and my wife have to get together and decide on, on a compromise. Uh, the other, oh, and on a national scale, we call that democracy, right? That's where all of us as a country have to compromise. The downside of that is no one gets what they want. But the upside of that is it's not the other option. And the other option is that one person or a small group of people decide they know what the right answer is and everybody else must just deal with it. I'm not going to tell you which happened with our washing up, by the way. Uh, but on, on, um, on a national level, we call that a dictatorship, right? And, and, I, and I hope that I can persuade you that that one doesn't work. Uh, ultimately, when we're deciding about important things on a national level, if one person or one small group force their opinion on everybody else, eventually somebody complains and refuses. And then you have a problem, you have to imprison them, or eventually you end up killing them. And so, and, and it's not a joke, from, from apartheid to the Nazis, fascist regimes end up having to kill people because it's not fair having one small group's uh, version of what should be a decision of an ethical question forced on everybody else. But I hope to convince you that ethical questions require compromise. It requires everybody, but also, on an ethical question, your background is important. Your personal experience, your experience in the world, your culture. This comes in the washing up example, I come from a different culture. Those two become important. So it becomes important that everybody has a say. To hammer home the point quickly, 2 plus 2 is a scientific question. It has a knowable answer. The answer is 4. Uh, very, very, in one of these talks I gave recently, it was quite cute. As soon as I put that up, one girl put her hand and said, 4, 4! But the point is that if I say it's 4 and you all say it's 5, we don't compromise and go, all right, then maybe it's 4.5. That's not how it works. There is an un it's uncompromising. There's a knowable answer. So how much rain will the airport receive? That's a science question. You can measure it, appropriate devices. Uh, does adding CO2 to the atmosphere increase the temperature? That's a scientific question. If so, by how much? We can do that. We can say with appropriate certainty, as I've just pointed out, what the answer. But I, I hope you get where I'm going. Uh, but, uh, if the planet is warming, what should we do about it? Is not a scientific question. That's an ethical question. It requires, it has no correct answer. It requires everybody with different perspectives, from the scientists, uh, through to the public to engage on this and to actually have their say. And it requires people with different backgrounds to compromise. And that is difficult. That's difficult on a national scale. That's almost impossible on a global scale. And hence why we continually uh, are trying to have these <coughs> governments to make a plan to resolve it. 
I want to give you a quick example to just illustrate how divisive these type of questions can be. And you guys have to play it's a game. Okay, the one thing is, for this game to work, you have to abide by the rules. And you don't want to see any cheating. And it's a very simple. You're going to be asked to make a decision to say yes to the decision, you put your hand up. To say no to the decision, you keep your hand down. You cannot change. Once you put your hand up, it's an irreversible decision. Okay? I don't want to see hands going up and coming down or going up. And also, if you don't make the decision, it's too late, it's gone. In the first example, I'm going to explain the rules to you. In the second example, it's quick fire. Okay? <laughs> the rules are quite simple. It's from philosophy. And it's <coughs> six problems entitled trolley problems. These ones, you might have heard of before. You envisage that there's a runaway train running down a railway track. No, it doesn't have to be it's just a normal train. The point is, uh, a evil genius has tied three innocent people to the rails such that the train is about to run them over. You find yourself in this uh, thought experiment, wandering in the woods one day, seeing this thing about to happen. And you notice that there is a lever here, which you can push, which will turn the train onto a side track. But you also notice that there's somebody on the track, and for reasons I can't explain, who, for reasons I can't explain, won't move. He will certainly be killed. So you have to make the decision. Do you do nothing and let three people die, or do you pull the lever, so putting your hand up will be the choice to pull the lever, and make one person die? I'm going to give you a countdown, but is it clear? <laughs> <coughs> putting your hand up to pull the lever in. Three, two, one. Okay, keep your hands up. Firstly, what I want you to do is look around and observe. About two-thirds of people have put their hand up, but some haven't. And this is a really interesting thing. Firstly, it demonstrates there's no right answer here, and it's divisive. It's a really simple question, and yet it's divisive. I want to hear from somebody with, with their hand up at the back corner. Why did you change? Because it's, I feel like it's much more better to do one than to do one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You put your hands down. Uh, this is brilliant. Uh, this is exactly what most people say. It's a form of philosophy referred to as utilitarianism. Okay? Utilitarianism is the idea that to make a decision, to make an ethical decision, what we should do is we should add up the net amount of good it does for people in the world, and subtract from that the net amount of bad, and find out which has the best cost-benefit analysis. Um, okay, so utilitarian. The, I want to point out, the proponents of it were driven mad by the idea. Okay, and I'm going to hopefully show you why. Uh, lady here, I noticed you didn't do anything. Why not? I don't have the background on why those people were being killed. So I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't want to be part of killing one innocent people. Well, you'd be killing three. Yeah, but maybe those people were, were being killed for something they did. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, and so you're not wanting to get involved, basically, yeah. because you don't have the background. Mm. So what's interesting, most of the general public choose to pull the lever. Most philosophers go with this lady and choose not to take action because they argue that by taking action you're killing one person. By doing nothing you're not getting involved. You kill no people. They would have died anyway. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the problem slightly. You're gonna have quick fire. Are you ready? Three, two, one, action. Okay, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. No, 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 no
Brilliant. And so in a minute, why didn't you save the kittens? Gentlemen in the red. There's a load of kittens and only one person to achieve a kitten. They're allowed to save the kittens and many kittens. Uh, okay, so this, this idea is called human exceptionalism, and it's another one that some of us from our backgrounds implicitly have, and some of us uh, have stronger and some are less strong. But it's the idea that human life is worth more than other life. Um, but it's interesting as to where do you draw the line. But everybody draws the line differently as to how many animal lives are, are worth human lives. For a time, I'm not going to do the last one, then I, I give you a thousand kittens. So, so principally, we, I, want, I hope that illustrated these kind of decisions divide people based on their backgrounds and implicit assumptions, some that we even don't know that we have. Let me very quickly just point out why uh, this applies particularly in climate change. Um, quoting from the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, he asked, um, what, did, what did people think at the beginning of the 19th century would be the biggest development? Okay? And, he said that people would have got, if we asked them this question, they would have got one right and one wrong. The one that they would have got right is that technology would revolutionise our lives. It has. Everybody believed it was going to happen. It did. And in amazing ways, and we'll come to that more in the discount rate. But what people didn't expect was the rise of ideologies. Everything from Marxism to apartheid. These beliefs in a, a way of making human societies better. And Isaiah Berlin points out that most people saw these as unrelated, but that they're actually not. Well, he argues that they're actually not. He argues that the one causes the other. The fact that the scientific method has been so wonderfully successful at solving scientific problems made these people on the right believe that it could solve ethical problems. They believed that there was a right answer to ethical problems, and if you just killed enough people, and the ends would justify the means, you would have a utopian society where everything would be perfect. And as I have pointed out, this is a mistake that uh, is being made, that we uh, don't appreciate that there are two very different types of questions. And I'd argue that today, most scientists don't know that. Uh, there's a big uh, a quote, and I can't remember who it's from, that scientists have about as much interest in the philosophy of science, as birds do in ornithology. You don't need to know anything about ornithology to be a bird, right? And equally, you don't need to know anything about the philosophy of science to be a scientist. But in, when it comes to climate change, where ethical problems are brought in, it helps. So nextly, the discount rate. This is about how we weigh up problems today against problems in the future. And it's uh, one of the big contentious issues, particularly which tends to separate environmentalists and economists when considering the issues. So really, the science and ethics, and that they're different, is the one big thing I want you to take out of the talk. The discount rate would be the second. These are the two really important concepts. So the discount rate basically tells us that problems are easier to solve in the future. I want to illustrate this <coughs> with an example. Let's say that you would like to tell your friend who's down in Cape Town today on the beach. He's somewhere remote. You want to tell him whether there's going to be waves for surfing tomorrow, okay? You have to solve that problem. You need to be able to tell him, are there going to be waves to surf tomorrow? Let's imagine you're doing it 70 years ago. The first thing you will need <coughs> is a computer the size of this building in order to predict the waves tomorrow. It would be absolutely vast. You'd need a team of people to operate it. Okay? And then, it would only do one of two computations a month. It would take years to predict the waves for tomorrow. But of course, by then they'll have already gone. But let's just say that you could have that prediction. If you wanted to tell your friend who's on the beach somewhere in Cape Town, you'd have to wait until the 1980s for cell phones to be invented, and they would be ones that you'd have to carry a brick round with, like this huge battery, in order to operate. Oh, um, skip forward to today. You have a more powerful computer than this one, and a better cell phone than that one in your pocket. That's quite incredible. This phone here could model the waves for tomorrow in a few hours. But you don't need to, because the internet's been invented. Somebody else has done the model already, you can look it up. A problem that used to take over 60 years to solve, now you can solve in six minutes. It's much easier to solve problems <coughs> in the future. Not just because of technology, but because the world is getting vastly, vastly richer. Look at that curve that shows global GDP. 
it looks like an exponential curve, right? Everybody who knows an exponential curve, if you're a scientist, would say that. Until you look at the left-hand axis, that's a log axis. It looks like an exponential curve on a log axis. Exponential on a log should be straight. There's an incredible rate at which the world is getting richer. So not only will we have better technology, but we have more money to throw at the problem in the future. That leads some economists to suggest that problems like climate change are better adapted to than mitigated for. Uh, one uh, statistician, he's very controversial, his name is Bjorn Nomberg, environmentalists hate him, they'll throw eggs at him. Uh, I, I will cite a, a couple of his pieces. Um, he, he makes the point that, in fact, if you have to choose between investing in solving money in, in, money in poverty alleviation or in climate change, it's really a choice between helping the one on the left or the one on the right, right? Because, um, uh, excuse my crude caricature, right? This is just to make the point that most Africans today don't have enough food. But if we follow the logic forward, the Africans of the future will have better technology and will be much richer. Who would you rather help? Bjorn Lomberg points out that the choice is obvious, surely, if it's an either or. And lots of environmentalists have come back with the point that this is a false diametric, we don't have to choose between one or the other. But maybe in some cases we do. And in those cases it would surely make more sense to help the people on the left. So I, I hope that I've presented a little bit around, and, and there's much more, I'm skimming the surface of the reasons why this, this discussion becomes so confusing and so divisive. Another really important one, which is worth throwing in, is, is your politics between on individual freedom. People who tend to be more right-wing tend to not want governments to interfere, and so we'll be much more closed off to an idea that requires governments to interfere in individual liberties. But put, put, the, point, the point is, science meets politics. Future meets um, uh, present needs. These, these and the scientific method being of organized skepticism, make it a really fascinating problem space to work in, and one that's really, really interesting and lively, and I, I hope I've given you a flavor that it's a nice one to get involved in doing research in. The second part, what to do about it, uh, is the two, two parts are shorter. I, I well, hope you're not getting too bored yet, but I promise you it's not too long. Uh, the first thing is I want to talk about the hedgehog and the fox, and convince you all that you need to think like a fox when it comes to problems like this. The hedgehog and the fox is a, an economics metaphor about two different ways of solving problems. Uh, I, I'm hoping, firstly, we should be familiar with the metaphor, what it refers to. Uh, is everybody, hey, hey, you could think like that. <laughs> 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 Okay, so uh, I'm hoping everybody knows. Ah, for goodness. Whoa! Just click, don't use timings. Can I get back there safely? Oh, okay. I hope everybody is, is aware that this is a hedgehog, right? So, uh, it just, they don't have those boots. That's just the only picture that I got. But it's, a, it's like a porcupine. It's a spiky mammal uh, that hangs out um, around Europe. Uh, and, uh, and then a fox. Uh, most of you will have thought of that one on the top right, but I've got two other suggestions uh, going down there. I'm sure some of you might have thought of Fox uh, in the middle there, uh, and, but I don't think many of you will have thought of the bottom right, and that's what, what the important point I want to make. These two, the metaphor is that hedgehogs have one extremely <coughs> good solution to the problems, right? They curl up in a tight and spiked ball, uh, and no predator can get at them. And this is, is really excellent. Uh, for a whole wide range of problems, but sometimes a new problem comes along that it can't solve. And one of those for a hedgehog is a car. Unfortunately, you don't have them here, but in Europe, they're all over the roads because when a car comes along, the hedgehog curls into a ball and it dies and it gets killed. A fox, on the other hand, is cunning. <coughs> it tries to solve problems by uh, using lots of different ideas, thinking about it, thinking outside the box. That's important. So if it comes to a fence, it might go under, it might go over, it might go around, it might go and steal the key, it might go and bribe somebody for the key. It'll try anything and try different things to solve the problem. And in a metaphor here, it's argued that scientists are hedgehogs of note. 
the scientific method has been so brilliant. And this comes back to the Ishan Berlin point, right? It's been so successful that we want to use it for everything. We've got this one really brilliant method. But I would argue that climate change presents a problem like a car. It's a new kind of problem because of all these reasons that I've presented, that um, science means politics, etc., and that we need to start thinking more like foxes, being a little foxy and a little cunning about our solutions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, some notes that I think a fox would make on presenting with a problem like climate change is firstly that we do very well as a human race about learning about one complex system, uh, the human body, uh, which I've got on the left hand side. We do very badly at looking after our planet. And part of the reason is that we have this thing called systems thinking for the body. You might not know it, but systems thinking is basically the <coughs> system. And it's a story we tell to kids, right? Every kid knows why you have a heart, a liver, and a lungs. And because we know that, we know how our bodies work, we look after them. But we don't have that for the planet. And so this discipline of earth system science is all about finding out what are the equivalent heart, body, heart, liver, and lungs of the earth, and how do these things come together to make the earth function, make it habitable. So earth system science will be the first thing. Bringing together different topics is important, different disciplines, to understand the problem. Next, the local context. Perspectives are important. It's worthwhile to note that from an African perspective, all of the things that are forecast to happen in the future climate are already happening today, right? Floods, droughts, refugees, these all affect people in their everyday lives today in Africa. In Cape Town in winter, every winter when the rains come, the townships flood. People lose their homes, people lose their lives. So the threat of these happening in 50 years' time is framed very differently from somebody living in the townships where they happen every year already to somebody, say, living in, what's Lani in Joburg? Um, Santon, right? Somebody living in Santon would have a very different perspective because they have a lot more to lose. Um, and just to point out, to hammer that home the different perspectives, uh, if you look at uh, deaths across the world annually, um, we have 10 million deaths mostly in Africa, due to easily curable diseases. These are just cured with medicine. It's a symptom of poverty. Indoor wood smoke is the next. Five million deaths. Again, a lack of cheap electricity. To get cheap electricity, you might want to consider building coal power plants, but there's a problem that we have the threat of climate change. At the minute, climate disasters cause very few deaths worldwide, but in a climate change scenario, these are going to rapidly go up. If today you're one of the people who is living in poverty, you're possibly more worried about this side of the graph than you are about this side of the graph. If you're somebody who's living in Santon or in the US, you're probably more worried about this side. And again, both of these perspectives have to come together and agree. And just, oh, my slide is messed up. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that. The, the slide is supposed to show that actually, and, and it's a shame because it's specifically for, for Mr. Dubé here, uh, <laughs> that I have an updated reference 